Good morning, Crossroads family. Why don't we stand and worship together?
ourselves and allow us to hear the words that you want us to hear this morning. And we just thank you and we love you. In your name, amen. And guys, I think that was such a good song, right? We're singing to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like, that's what we came here to do today. Can, can we sing that chorus again together? And, and just, again, a proclamation, like we are here to worship. Let's not left a word unsung this morning. Let's do that again. to be here in this place, to lift high your name, to sing how good you are to us. We humans, you came down into history to save us, to redeem us, so we could have a relationship with you. And now it is our joy to sing back to you the truths of Scripture, that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit has redeemed us and has saved us. Lord, we thank you for that fact. Lord, bless us now, we pray. In your name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. This last week was epic because we did Vacation Bible School. Who here remembers Vacation Bible School as a little one? Yeah, okay, I remember it. We've got a recap video to let you a little glimpse of what happened this last week. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing this morning? That looked great, didn't it? I'm glad I'm over like 10. I could not climb that thing. I just, it'd be down. It'd be down. And I'd be down. Welcome to Crossroads this morning. We're glad you're here. If you're new, if you'd like to find out more information about us or get connected somehow, text the word growth to 94,000. That's the way to get connected with us. As you know, uh, our mission here at Crossroads is to help people to take their next step with Jesus, right? That's what it's all about, helping people to take their next step with Jesus. So that's what VBS was all about. 
Each night, there were anywhere from 140 to over 200 kids. There were 150 volunteers helping out. And by the way, if you look around today and you see some bleary-eyed people, those are the people that volunteered to help. Because many of the people worked 40, 50 hours a week and then went to VBS and didn't get home till 9 or 10 at night. So actually, anybody here volunteer? Stand up, raise your hands. Cool, very cool. Stand up, everybody. Give them a hand. That's, that's a lot of people. And you know what? They're still recuperating. You probably got to give them another week, okay? Then they'll be back to normal, sort of. So our next big event will be in a couple weeks. It's summer camp. That's for kids in sixth grade through 12th grade. And uh, a lot of preparation will be needed for that. Need a lot of volunteers for that. But be in prayer for that because it's just the same as BBS, right? It's helping people take their next step with Jesus. By the way, I forgot to mention, and we should give a hand for this too, 26 kids accepted Jesus as their personal savior at BBS. 26. So let's, let's pray for the same at the uh, summer camp. A few other things here. The next congregational meeting will be July 25th at 6 p.m. right here at the church. Uh, child care will be provided. Who's that? Looks like mom, doesn't it? <laughs> and I, I'm guessing we're going to talk about uh, the next steps for the church and looking for a pastor and things like that. The other thing is the next Ladies' Summer Deck Days. It probably says women. Yep, says it. Women's Summer. I don't know what the difference is. But Women's Summer Deck Days. And that will be July 31st. And you can register online for that. You know, these events don't happen without our giving, right? It takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of giving to get these things to happen. That's what uh, our gifts are used for. So just remember, there's a black box there in the back. Or like Leslie and I do, we just give online and automatically it comes out. So you don't even have to think about the money is gone. Poof, your money's gone. But it's going to a good cause, right? Let's pray for our uh, offering and let's pray for our sermon today. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful week of BBS. Thank you for the wonderful volunteers who gave of their time so much. Lord, uh, bless them for that. Thank you for the 26 children who gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And we just pray that uh, we, as a congregation, as a church, will continue to raise these kids up so that they will know you even better. And we just pray that they, this is a decision that will stick with them for the rest of their lives. Lord, we pray for the upcoming summer camp also, that it will be very similar to BBS and that kids come to know you. And those who already, those who already know you, that their faith will be deepened because of it. And Lord, we want to lift up a couple people today. We want to pray for Marilyn Wright. Thank you that she's home from the hospital and feeling better, but we just pray the doctors will be able to uh, continue to work with her and she'll uh, feel better. And also, Lord, we want to pray for the Lucina's grandson who is still in the hospital from a car accident. Lord, heal him, touch him. Uh, we pray that he'll be patient uh, because it's going to be a long road ahead of him. Uh, help us to be ministers to this young man and... Um, Thank you that we can trust you with this. Lord, we pray for our sermon that we're about to hear. Thank you for Pastor Austin. Speak through him and open our ears to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, John. Well, like John said, my name is Austin. I think, yeah, kids are dismissed. You guys know the drill. Look at that. Perfect. Uh, like John said, my name is Austin. I serve as campus pastor of our Gary Avenue campus. I've met some of you for the first time today. So good to connect with you. I think um, it's been uh, so good to see all that has happened. I normally spend a lot of time over there, and so it's been a while since I've been at this campus, and just seeing, again, the beautiful uh, remodel job that has happened here. It just looks so well. The speaker system, really sharp. The worship team, love the children's space down there. I mean, so good. I just think of, uh, I was really loved Pastor Craig. I know that last week was his last week, and man, really loved that guy. Did so much for what happened here, starting in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know. I have a lot of networks in church life. I don't know a lot of guys who started churches in a pandemic like we did. And so you all were brave and like ready to go. Love that. Love excited for their calling down in Springfield, Illinois. But I'm real excited about the future of this campus. I think the best is yet to come for this uh, site here. God's going to do some great and uh, marvelous things. And so uh, I talked to one gentleman here this morning. He was going to bring up 
to the stage when I got here a fire extinguisher. Uh, because what John didn't say was we had fireworks at the end of VBS. And they were the big pop-off ones. And I may have had some influence with fire department coming to the other campus last summer. And so, uh, Paul, thanks so much for, I don't even know if he's in the room right now, but uh, not bringing a fire extinguisher up here. But VBS was fantastic, loved it, ended with fireworks, so good. 26 kids come to know Jesus, like that's why we do what we do as a church. If you're new with us, we exist at Crossroads really to help people take their next step with Jesus. And so we just help 26 little ones take their next step with Jesus by committing to follow him. Good week all around. We definitely want to see that for the high school students um, as well. Well, I'm here. I'm excited to preach the message. We are in a series called Judges, Tough Love. If you will, turn with me to Judges. If you don't know where Judges is, it's okay. Just go to the table of contents at the beginning of the Bible, look for that page number, and then no one needs to know you don't know where Judges is, okay? It's okay, Marty, it's okay. Oh, or you pull up your iPad and you just push on the word Judges and you're there. So we're going to be in Judges, uh, Judges chapter 13, Judges chapter 13. Well, this morning you came to church, and I hope you came to church to be inspired, right? I know uh, we have some people come back from Florida, they were inspired at all their Disney adventures, but this morning I brought some inspirational quotes for you, all right? If you remember back in the 90s and 2000s, these horrible, awful, inspirational posters, they were in my high school, they were in like office buildings. You guys remember these posters, okay? Like they're just like bad quotes um, that I don't know where they came up with them, okay? I think we got the first one here uh, on leadership. Yeah, so leadership, yeah, you remember this stuff? I think it says the supreme quality for leadership is yada, 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 who cares, right? Like just a bad, bad inspiration. I think the next one is teamwork. You got some guys rowing and a long quote, very good. So someone uh, was brilliant enough to think of non-inspirational quotes, right? Like take the concept and just flip it on its head and go with non-inspirational quotes. And so uh, I think we got one of those here. Uh, believe in yourself because the rest of us think you're an idiot. <laughs> great. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, that's very great. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about Samson. I think the next one helps frame the life of Samson, the very strong man in the Bible. It says, mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning <laughs> to others. Uh, Samson, the strong Hercules fellow of uh, Judges chapter 13. We're talking about him today. I mean, his life is littered with mistakes. I mean, if you watched daytime soap operas, okay, which none of you I know do, uh, but it's got everything in this narrative. It's got deceit. It's got lust. We've got disobedience, we've got demeaning of others, we have a lack of community, disrespect to parents, lack of loyalty to his own people, we, he's rude to his wife, I mean, flippant with his tongue, I mean, he has a ton of mistakes, and we just wonder, why is Samson in the Bible, <laughs> Like, why was he written there? Maybe it was, as the uninspirational quote says, is a warning for others to not follow in his ways. There's a theme that runs throughout Judges, and it's in the very last verse of Judges. It's up here on the screen. It says this, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see this quote throughout the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And there was this continual cycle that happened in Judges. The people of Israel, they would go into disobedience. They would do what was right in their own eyes. They would disobey, and then God would bring in some discipline on them. They would bring in an oppressive nation on them to, to, to put their thumb, their, their footprint on them, and, and it was tough and hard. And, and then they would cry out to God, and then he would bring about deliverance. And the deliverance was in these judges like Samson or Jephthah or Gideon or Deborah 
or Ehud. We've studied all of these folks. And the, the interesting thing about Samson, though, is the people of Israel aren't seen here as ever crying out. They had gotten so comfortable with their sin and they have totally embraced the fact that they love the sin of being oppressed by the other nations. Samson, a life full of mistakes. We're about ready to find. Here's a question I want us to wrestle with this morning in our own life. As we study the life of Samson, we're going to see that God's going to use Samson. God's going to use him in some mighty ways. But here's the question I want you and I to wrestle with. God is going to use you as well. The question needs to be, will your life be an example to follow or a warning to observe? God's going to use you. It's like, we don't need to pray, God, please use me. No, no, no. He's going to use you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. The question is more about, uh, is my life going to be a billboard for others to follow? Or is my life going to be a billboard for others to see, don't go this direction? Like, this is the warning. Some of you here have young ones, kids. Some of you are grandparents now. And the legacy you leave is so important. And I ask you the question, as a parent, as a grandparent, is, is your kids going to look at your life and say, hey, grandpa, grandma, this is the life to model. This is what godliness looks like. Or are your kids going to say, no, that's, that's grandpa or grandma. Don't follow what they did. Whatever they did, do the opposite of. See, see God's going to use you. Which billboard do you want to be? What do you want God to do in your life? Well, let's look at uh, Judges chapter 13. This narrative is so good. Samson gets the most airtime out of all judges. It's like a fascinating, fascinating story. So you with me, Judges 13? You feel like you might be sleeping on me, okay? So here's the thing. Turn to your neighbor. You need to flex on them and say, I'm stronger than you. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's okay. Oh, yeah. Come on, flex on your neighbor. Yeah, okay, there you go, there you go. Ben, did that feel good? No, it didn't work, it didn't work well. Okay, all right. So Samson, right, is known as the Hercules strongman. Let's find out what happened before he was ever born. Chapter 13, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them up into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Years. So again, uh, they would disobey. God would discipline them by putting them in oppression by these Philistines, and then he would turn up to deliver them eventually. Uh, verse 2 There was a certain man of Zor, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman, and he said to her, Behold, you are barren. <laughs> I'm like, you know, like, I'm sure she probably knows that, right? Like, anyone going through infertility is like, yeah, that's a heavy yoke to bear. And so uh, the angel comes, is like, thanks. Uh, like, I already knew that. And then he piles it on a little bit more. He says, um, uh, you are barren and have not born children. Uh, yeah, duh. Like, that's my prayer, like, all the time. Thank you for that. Uh, verse 4. Or, sorry, at the end of verse 3. But you shall conceive, okay, good news, and bear a son. Even better news, someone to carry on the family name. And verse 4, therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. 
All right, so, so we got this story, this narrative, this, this godly couple, Manoah and his unnamed wife. Why is she not named? I don't really know. The commentators are mixed, but it almost alludes to the fact of oftentimes when, when people struggle with infertility, it's oftentimes silently they do that. Not many people know about the struggles of infertility, so you just imagine the loneliness of not having the very thing she felt she was created to produce children for her husband. And, and here this angel approaches her. And she, she gets the news she's going to have a son. But there's these stipulations, as it were, upon her and her husband and the baby she will have in nine months. The stipulations are what's called a, a Nazarite vow. It's, it's three things. Uh, the first is you can't go to Benny's Beverage Depot ever to get any sort of alcoholic beverage, okay? None of it, all right? Second is uh, uh, you cannot be any, near anything that is dead, any carcass of anything because that is unclean for the Jewish people. Third and final, and the one you probably know the most, is don't cut the hair. You got to have the flow, all right, if you're a Nazarite, okay? So uh, no alcohol, uh, no coming near dead bodies, and don't cut the hair, okay? Pretty good? You good? good? That's the stipulations on this child. So the woman, uh, it runs to her husband, Manoah, tells him all that had happened, how we're under this like Nazarite vow. We're going to have a son. She's super excited. Manoah, he is like the worst lawyer and worst accountant you've ever seen. He loves the questions. He's got this like paragraph, paragraph, detailed question. He wants to ask this angel of the Lord. So they pray, verse six, they pray a, a great prayer. Let's look at that in verse, uh, sorry, eight. Verse eight, then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. <sighs> like, that's a pretty good prayer. Like, this shows me that the couple that would bear Samson is a godly couple. Like, their prayer is God. Nine months, I'm going to have a baby. I don't know what to do. And every first parent knows this, right? You're just like, uh, I got to care for another human being now? And so he's like, come back and teach us and, and give us everything down to the nose. Like the most accounting thing is like figure out exactly what we're supposed to do. And, and God answers the prayer. Angel Lord comes back to them. And Manoah has this exchange, this conversation with the angel of the Lord in verse 12. And Manoah says to this angel of the Lord, now when your words come true, it's faith. Like, like I believe you, it's going to come true that we're going to have this son after being infertile. And when they come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? Like, like help, help, me, help me form as a parent the mission of my child. That's a great question to ask God if you're a parent in this room today. Like, like, God, you've given me one, two, or three kids. What is the mission for their life? What are you calling them to do? Is it being a lawyer? I want them to be the best lawyer they can be. Is it to be a doctor? I want them to be the best doctor. Is it to be a janitor? I want them to be the best janitor they can be. Like, whatever the mission you have them, I want to form them and, and shape them because you've called them into my home to shape them. I want to do well in that. And, and, and Manoah, great prayer to have if you're a parent. Like, what is his mission? How do I inform that? And, and so... Uh, he says, don't cut the hair, don't let him touch dead bodies, and don't drink alcohol. <laughs> like, that's the three things to do. Like, if you don't do, like, don't do that and we're good, is what the angel Lord says. And the angel Lord disappears. Manoah's afraid. He thinks he's going to die because he saw the Lord. And his wife is like, babe, if he was going to kill us, he'd already done it. Like, stop it. Calm down. And then we find in the end of the chapter, verse 24, and the woman bore a son 
and called his name Samson. It means sunny boy or sunshine, all right, for you um, uh, remember the Titans fans, all right? And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Man, chapter 13 is awesome. It's like everything you want in a kid, right? Like he's got godly parents, he's been blessed by the Lord, and the Spirit of God is resting upon him and stirring him up. Like, so hopeful. Like, the best judge Israel's ever had is great up until this point. Like, like the most, like Jephthah last week, he, he was born uh, uh, from a prostitute, right? He was broken up by his, his stepbrothers, right? Like, like horrible, horrible background. Samson's got it all here. And then Samson's born in verse 14, or chapter 14. Follow with me, chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Samson here uh, says the second and third word is went down. Five times in chapter 14, you're going to see Samson goes down. He went down with his father. Samson went down. And while the narrator is not talking about geographical going down, like towards the south, it's more about morally, Samson is repeatedly going downhill, like a swirling the sewer system, going down, down, down in a spiral. And he went down to Timnah. Timnah's like, you're not supposed to go there. It's like Samson's like, well, I might uh, want to just share the gospel with people. And so that's why I'm there. It's like, no, 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 you weren't there for that. You were there to find a girl. And so he finds this girl, and he goes back and talks to his parents in verse 2. Then he came up and told his father and his mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Verse 3, but... His father and his mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. For here it is, here it is, here it is. She is right in my eyes. Remember the theme throughout Judges? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. He hears Samson. He's in this place he's not supposed to be. He's going about looking for this girl. And it's kind of like every college student in college, they come back and they say, uh, Mom, Dad, I met this girl. And, and the parents say, well, does she know Jesus? Well, no, no, no. But, uh, you know, she's beautiful and she just star- she's uh, the apple of my eye. And, and the parents are like, well, but, but she doesn't believe the same thing you do. It's okay though, like she's smart and like she's got good grades and like all this stuff and, and like Samson's just totally blinded because he's, he's looking through the lens through his own eyes rather than God's eyes and Samson, um, here he's, he's unteachable. The, the, there's no humility here. There's no listening to your godly parents to say don't, marry this girl. No, no, no. I, I'm going to do what I want to do. Go get her for me. Like that demanding and just absolute no humility here. And verse four, verse four is like one of those Scooby-Doo, whoa, whoa, like scenarios. Like you read across this and verse four is confusing. It's like, wait, What? Like, that kind of blows up some categories for me on this whole, like, God piece, all right? Verse 4, follow with me, if you will. His father and his mother did not know that it was from the Lord, that is, the marriage. Like, Samson wanting this girl he shouldn't have is from the Lord. 
For he was seeking, that is God, was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines at the time the Philistines ruled over Israel. (laughs) Hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, these are godly parents telling their son not to get married to this girl. And in the very next verse, we see God was allowing this to happen. It was actually part of the plan. So that God could accomplish what he called Samson to do. To to stir up opposition with the Philistines. How do, we, how do we reconcile this verse? Like Samson's going the wrong direction and, and God's almost like, yep, I know he is. I see it. And, and I'm still getting my will done with or without Samson's agreement. See, the concept here is two theological truths coinciding in one verse, and it's very rare in scripture. And the two theological concepts are uh, God's sovereignty and human responsibility, or we might say free will. And and these two uh, huge theological topics throughout scripture are all in verse four, where God is over here, and he's like, my goal is to rescue the people of Israel out and deliver them from the Philistines. That's my job. That's what I'm going to do. I want to use Samson, but Samson's over here doing his own thing and doing his own human responsibility, free will, and he's messing it up, but I'm still going to use him. One author said, uh, how do you reconcile God's sovereignty, how he's ruling over everything, and then my human responsibility? How do you reconcile the two? And he responded by saying, you don't reconcile friends. (laughs) Like, they work together. God's sovereignty is at play in my good decisions and my poor decisions. So I leave you with the same question. God is going to use Samson. God is going to use you. The question on the table in your human responsibility in all of God's sovereignty is, do you want to be an example for others to follow or do you want to be a warning for others to observe? Samson's choosing the latter. The question is laid before you and I this morning. Let's keep moving on. Verse 5, then Samson, he went down with his father and his mother to Timnah. So now he's taking his parents. Maybe his parents like relented, like we're tired of arguing with you. Okay, fine. We'll go get this wife that you really want. And and they they came to the vineyards. Wait, hold on. The the vineyards. Hold hold on. Uh, Question. What happens at a vineyard? Like what grows at a vineyard? Come on, I need the response. Grapes, okay? And grapes are used and pressed into what? Wine. Okay, wait. Oh, Samson. Wait, wait. What was the first thing in the Nazarite vow you're not supposed to do, Samson? No Benny's Beverage Depot, okay? No going to the vineyards. So uh, can we say like strike one? We're going to see later on, he's going to host a, a reception dinner. It's his, it's, it's his uh, after the wedding celebration. And the word in Hebrew is meant for like this, this huge, enormous uh, alcohol party, okay? So not only do we find him in the vineyard, but then he hosts a huge open bar reception, okay? Like, not a good plan, Samson. Mistake one, don't do that and. Here he's in Timnah with his parents in the vineyards. And behold, uh, middle verse 5, a young lion came towards him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and though he had nothing in his hands, he tore the lion in pieces as one who tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and he talked with this woman, and here it is again, She was right in 
Samson's eyes. Verse 8, and after days he went and returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion, and honey, he, he scraped it out into his hands, and he went on, and eating as he went, he came to his father and his mother, and he gave them some to eat, and they ate, but he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. So, so here's the incredible Hulk, Samson. Lion comes on him. Spirit of the Lord, he tears it apart like uh, pulled pork, okay? And just like rips this thing in shreds. No one's having pulled pork later, right? Uh, rips this thing in half. And, and goes to get his girlfriend, who is, again, right in his own eyes. And la days later, he's passing a dead carcass. And he reaches down in and takes out the honey and begins to eat it. Hold on. Break with me. Jacqueline, help me out. Uh, number two, what is the thing Samson's not supposed to do? Help me out. Don't be around anything dead. Samson, you're messing up, bro. It's not supposed to be this way. You're in the vineyard. You're hanging out with a carcass. But, but not only that, you went and you deceived your own parents who were under the same vow you were. And you deceived them. And in your deceit, you defiled your own parents because they in turn touched something was unclean. They didn't know. But twice it says he withheld these things from his parents. Right, right. Sin, we love to hide it, or we think we're good at hiding it. This is Adam and Eve, our great grandparents, right? When they sinned, they covered up themselves and they, they felt naked, and, and their covering up wasn't good enough. And so God had to come along and kill an animal, the first sacrifice in Scripture, and they covered them over. And what we love to do when we sin is to hide it, we scramble. And we hide. Samson's doing the same thing. The model, the hero of our story, the judge, the deliverer of Israel is here hiding his sin. Well, he goes to his reception dinner. It's seven days long. And the text says he doesn't have any friends. Because they give him 30 groomsmen for his wedding. It's like... Bro, that's sad. Like, you went to your own wedding, you didn't have any groomsmen? So they give him these 30 dudes. And Samson, he's feeling jovial because he's at the uh, wine party that he's putting on himself. And he makes this deal, this bet at his own reception dinner. He says, uh, if you can guess my riddle, I'll give you 30 pieces of clothing. But if you can't, you owe me 30 pieces of clothing. So Samson, they agree, and Samson tells them the riddle. The riddle's this in verse 14. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Uh, Samson finishes the, the riddle and the guys try and figure it out. These 30 groomsmen, the guys that are supposed to be supporting him, are trying to, uh, not, uh, to get him to break down. And they can't figure out the riddle. So they go to his uh, newly minted wife and said, uh, you get him to tell you the riddle. And then come tell us so we don't lose. And if you don't, we're going to burn down you and your dad and your house. It's like, Wow. That escalated really quickly for 30 pieces of, 30 pieces of clothes, okay? And so um, she goes to Samson. Samson, like, tell me the riddle. And Samson's like, I haven't even told my parents. I'm not going to tell you. We may be on the honeymoon, but I ain't going to tell you. And so another day goes by. Another day goes by. It's like the end of the seven days, and she just wears Samson down. Samson gives in, tells her the riddle, she goes, tells them, they come to Samson, verse 18. 
Samson, yo, we, we know your riddle. Here it is, Samson. Verse 18. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? His riddle was about his own sin of touching a dead body. He made light of his own sin. He thought it was rather funny, his own sin. I'm going to make a joke out of my own sin. Child of God, we can't hate things the Lord hates and laugh at them at the same time. You just can't do it. You can't, as the Apostle Paul says, put to death that which is fleshly in me, and all the time over here I'm laughing about it, or I'm making light of my sin. It's not that bad. It's okay. It was just last weekend. It's, it's, it's fine. No one needs to know. We don't have to tell anyone. It's my own secret. Oh, do you remember what we did? And you begin to make light of it. Samson here is making light of his own sin. And Samson responds to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Now, guys, uh, it's not good to call your wife a cow, okay? Especially on your honeymoon. That's going to get back to her. Okay, like bad move, right? So super disrespectful to his new wife, right? And then the end, Samson, he's mad, he's angry. It literally says in the, in the verse, he had hot anger. Not, not for his people that they would be won out of their slavery to the oppression of the Philistines. No, he was mad because he lost a bet. So he goes and he knocks down 30 guys, takes and steals their clothes, gives them to his groomsmen. And then he's so upset, he goes back and lives in his dad's basement. In verse 20, goes back to live in his dad's basement. Verse 20 is just super sad. Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. <laughs> Bro. Like, not a great ending to chapter 14. Like, you, you lost it all. Like, the, the wife you wanted that you shouldn't have had, that your parents told you not to get, now is given to your best man at your wedding. You, you didn't even get to finish the honeymoon, bro. Not only that, uh, you're now back in your parents' basement, which... It's interesting, you don't think God wanted him back there with the godly influence of his parents? <laughs> and and the, the third thing is that this, the Philistines are stirred up. They're, they're in fights now with, with Samson. It's as if at the end of chapter 14, we press the reset button and God's will has all been accomplished and Samson's fraught peril has all fallen under its own weight because he was the warning to observe, not the example to follow. Next week, Pastor Scott will finish Samson's narrative, but to, today, what can we learn of the story of Samson? Again, I ask the question, God, God's going to use you, child of God. Like, lock it down. Do, don't pray, God, use me. No, no, he's going to use me. The better prayer as a follower of Jesus, God, use me to be a godly example to those around me, to my spouse, to my kids. I don't want to be the warning to observe. Three things I want to leave us with is my life will be an example to follow if I'm, the first thing is godly. It's godly. Like throughout scripture, there's this sense of godliness matters. It just matters. In a day and age, in a culture where there's a minimizing of sin, like Samson, there's taking light of sin. We're making fun of sin. And God says, no, 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 no. Like if you want to be an example to follow and, and, and be a billboard for others to look to, you've got to walk in godliness. You've got to yearn for my heart. 
child of God, when you've experienced the goodness of God and the good and richness of a relationship with Jesus, that is so much richer than anything the world has to offer, that you don't want that. You don't desire, you don't have the appetite for it because Jesus is so much better. And it's only through a cultivated, godly lifestyle. So, so yeah, read the Bible, you know, be at church and, and join small group and all those things for sure, but, but search after the heart of God. Like, God, I want to be a godly example to my kids, to my spouse, to my coworkers. I want to put you on display. I want that life, God. And so godliness, his parents, they were the godly example. There's a, two words that his mom, Samson's mom, used when she met with God. When, when the angel of the Lord came to her, she went to told, tell her husband. She said, it was very awesome. <laughs> it was very awesome. Time with the Lord should be that for you. And that's cultivation of godliness. Is, Man, that was so awesome. Being with God's people in his presence. And so to be a godly example, we must be uh, godly. Second is humble. To be humble. That's a theme throughout scripture. Samson, he refused to listen to his parents. Refused to listen to the godly influence around him. He just was not humble in the least. So the question I have for you this morning is, what has God been speaking to you about? And you've been tightening up your vertebrae, saying, no, 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 God. (laughs) Like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. No, 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 God, I'm not going to listen to that text of Scripture. No, no, I'm not going to listen to that mentor, that godly person in my life. And you you stiffen up. And, And what happens is you put on the lens that Samson did where you're seeing things through your own eyes instead of God's eyes. So, so, so who is that person in your life that you need to submit and listen to and be humbly say, that's not godliness, I need to listen to them. Humility, that's the godly example. Third, third is, is obedient. Obedient. He's two strikes out. <laughs> right? The hair. You guys all know the Delilah story that's coming. But, 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 but in two chapters, he drank the alcohol he wasn't supposed to, and he played with the dead body he shouldn't have. It's just straight up disobedience. And his warning to observe is don't do that. Obey. It is so much better to obey. The hardship and the hard knocks of disobedience always leaves us empty and broken, and there's just the shattering behind us, the collateral damage. But, but don't forget, if you and I are here, and I know each of us have disobeyed the Lord, that God still is going to use Samson. Even in the midst of his own stupidity and disobedience, God still uses. So you need to have hope. That even in our disobedience, God uses us. But if you want to be the example to follow rather than the warning to observe, you've got to live with obedience. Here's what I want to do. I want to close and just ask that you bow your heads, you close your eyes. And I'm going to lead you through a prayer prompt. It's going to be three different prayers that you want to pray silently in your heart to the Lord. As a response to this message... And as you think, as you contemplate, like, Lord, I want to be the example for others to follow, not the warning to observe. And so in your heart, I want you first to pray this prayer. I want you to pray and commit your way to godliness. Just right now in your heart, I'm going to give you a couple moments. Pray, Lord, I'm committing today, on this day, to commit my life towards godliness. I want the godly life. Next, what I want you to pray in your heart is, um, who do you need to listen to? 
Maybe it's a peer, maybe it's a mom or a dad, or maybe it's the text of scripture that's been speaking to you, and you have just not given in. You're not going to listen. And, and so, so the prayer you might need to pray right now is, Lord, help me listen to, and then fill in the blank. Help me listen to maybe a mom, scripture, whatever, whatever the Lord's telling you to be humble on right now. Pray that prayer. Lord, help me listen to blank. And then third and final is, Lord, give me the strength to obey you. Give me the Samson strength to obey you. Go ahead and pray that now. Lord, Lord, we're here because we want a glimpse of your glory. We want to see you. Lord, transformation takes place when we give our life to you. So right now in this moment, we are committing our way to godliness. Lord, we want to be the billboard of the example for others to follow. Lord, mold us, make us. As the one who shapes the pottery, Lord, we are in your hands. Do that for us, we pray. That's what we want. And Lord, break us down in the moments of our stubbornness. And when we want to look at life through our own eyes and it's breaking your heart, Lord, break us down. Let us be humble to listen to that still small voice. So make us as well agile to pivot when we've gone the wrong way. Lord, give us the inner strength. Samson had outer strength. He had not inner strength. Give us the inner strength to walk in obedience so we are not that warning to observe but that example to follow. Lord, give us that strength. It's hard. Temptation comes and it's hard, but Lord, you have given us the greatest resource to that strength we need and that is the Spirit of God. You tell us The same spirit that raised God from the dead is the same spirit that's at work with us and has unlimited power to help us be strong and walk in obedience to you. Lord, right now, we're in this room. We are your people. We are the the sheep of your pasture. And Lord, we do go astray. And so in those moments, we do go astray. Lord, you call us back because of your grace and your mercy. Oh, your grace and your mercy. Oh, how we love that. Thank you. We love you. We're your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand and keep worshiping. And let's really declare this. The song Christ is in me.